everyone, my name is Beth Betcher and I lead Oracle's North America HCM business. Welcome to Skills Matter, what your organization needs to survive and thrive. From unforeseen crises to new work paradigms, the future of work has dramatically shifted and continues to face massive changes. Weathering turbulent and unexpected conditions in the future requires new levels of agility. Your organization's skills are your greatest asset in building workforce agility and preparing for the future. In our session today, we'll explore building and maintaining an always up-to-date inventory of your organization's current skills, capturing and understanding insights into your organization's ever-evolving skilled landscape in order to develop targeted hiring and reskilling plans, and creating a skills strategy that supports your business goals. I really hope you enjoy our session today. Skills power every talent process in your organization, from recruiting to performance reviews to career mobility and beyond. Skills are the key component in your talent supply chain and fuel your company's growth. But how can you really make skills work for you? Start by understanding the skills in your organization, what you have and what's trending versus what the needs and gaps might be and be sure to keep the skills information up to date so you can make decisions based on real-time data. They should be refreshed with each interaction an employee has with the system. But you can't stop there. Next, you need to put those skills to work by connecting skills to jobs, skills to people, skills to learning, performance, recruitment, and beyond. These connections are often overlooked, but are critical to improving the matching of people to jobs, candidates to open roles, even learning recommendations to achieve career goals, and so much more. Once those connections are made, you can use them to provide tailored recommendations and guidance on jobs, reskilling, upskilling, gigs, and even mentors for employees, managers, and teams. And because skills are always evolving, to keep your workforce engaged, you need to deliver skills, recommendations, and insights in a single location. Making adding skills, starting learning courses, even applying for new jobs, or finding a coach, only a click away. Unleash your talent potential through the power of skills. Hi. I'm Yvette Cameron. I'm the Senior Vice President of Oracle Cloud HCM Product Strategy. And I'm excited to be joined today by two industry experts to talk about the changing nature of skills management in organizations today. Now, for years, we've seen an increasing focus on skills and competency management, from the move to skills-based hiring, to the improved delivery of learning, to drive improved reskilling and upskilling initiatives across organizations. And yet a significant gap still exists in how skills are identified, managed, and developed across organizations. So what's needed is a new approach, a new approach in identifying and managing these skills that is more dynamic, intelligent, trusted, and pervasive. So to talk more about how to create this new dynamic skills approach and to discuss the various phases in skills management transformation, I'm thrilled to have with me today, Ray Wong, who is the founder of Constellation Research and also author of multiple books. 
Also joining me today is Aaron DeSmet. He's a senior partner at McKinsey and Company and the co-author of the recently published research by McKinsey entitled Building Workforce Skills at Scale to Thrive During and After the COVID-19 Crisis. Ray, Aaron, I'm so excited to have you joining me today. Thank you. Oh, good to see you, Yvette. Thanks, Yvette. Great to see you. Ray, I'm going to start my first question with you. Fundamentally, where do you see organizations are struggling the most when it comes to understanding skills across their organization? So the second hardest part in empowering employees is really putting that skills inventory together. Uh, it's getting the incentives behind it, getting people to think about why it's important for them to do this. But the hardest part is actually agreeing on ontologies. Both are barriers that can be overcome with experience, but one approach is to identify the hot skills first. How do we build for them? Take hard skills, AI, ML, data science, right? But also think about soft skills, leadership, empathy, communication, teamwork, problem solving, and critical thinking. These are all important areas, but start thinking about the humanization part and making sure folks are interested and there's a market for those inventory of skills. That's great, Ray. So Aaron, skills are a hot topic right now, but it seems they've always been a hot topic, at least with regards to understanding and managing skills. So where do you see organizations struggling the most today around understanding their skills inventories? I think they've always struggled to an extent, but there was more time in the past to figure it out. To get people, if you didn't have the right people, we'll find some new folks, we'll get them trained up. And over time, you know, five years from now, we might have some incremental changes. We might need more of, of a skill, more depth in a skill, more senior people with more experience. We might need more of one role uh, and fewer people in another role. What's happening today is technology and automation are fundamentally transforming roles. So half of a job might still exist and the other half might change into something totally different. And a lot of the skills we thought we had um, might not apply anymore. And skills we need might be adjacent skills. Many companies don't even track the skills beyond the job that the person's in. They may have a whole host of skills that could be relevant for a next generation of activities and work that we don't even know because we only tracked the skills directly relevant to the job they were hired into in the first place. Uh, those are great observations. Um, so Ray, let me come back to you then. In, in your recent report about skills, you stress the importance of creating a dynamic approach to skills and competency development. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, that's a great point, right? Once you've done your enterprise skills assessment, now you got to figure out how do you apply that skills assessment knowledge across talent processes, right? How do we tap into internal talent? How do we know the skills that are required for success on a job ahead of time so we can accelerate the identification of internal talent for these new roles? Then once we have that, we also want to sense demand signals for new skills. What are the hot skills? What are people going after? What courses are important? Where are people putting their energies, both on the demand side and the supply side? You're looking at the job boards and you're also looking at training to see where people are interested in what's going on. And of course, how do we encourage employees to maintain up-to-date profiles? Um, is that an incentive? How do we do recognition? How do we get people to manage that? Like knowledge bases were in the past. These are hard things. People don't always update uh, their profiles. What can we do to make it more automated and easy to get there? And then of course, how do we develop new skills in real time, especially in areas where we've got hot technologies, where we want to think about training and development, Think about reskilling. How do we create programs to deliver rapid and more frequent training programs and improve the training library? And then, of course, how do we encourage employees to quickly gain new skill sets and create a culture that supports the rapid learning there in terms of both the rewards and a recognition structure? And, of course, how do we determine which skills and competencies to remove from the portfolio things that are no longer relevant? Ray, those are all fantastic observations. Um, and the idea, especially of you know, sensing skills and changes in the talent, um, the skills talent supply chain is, is phenomenal. A lot of what you mentioned though is, is, is some of the challenge that we faced over the past. How do we get employees to update their profiles? How do we um, um, track this information? So what, what makes today's approach dynamic and what are some of the ways that organizations can really encourage a more dynamic approach? 
Yeah, one of the ways to do that is to improve the incentives, right? Helping people understand the link between certain types of skills that are in demand with upward mobility or promotion or more time off or thinking about the ability to actually improve another area that they might be interested, in, whether it's managing more people, whether it's becoming a better individual contributor. Um, it's really a tailoring back to people's needs, but there's got to be that incentive to get them to understand that updating a skills profile, updating their skills inventory actually gives them more opportunities opportunities to do the things that are more aligned with their work-life balance or, of course, their career goal aspirations. Yeah. Updating profiles seems to be the age-old um, age old challenge for us <laughs> as an industry. Um, Aaron, you co-authored the McKinsey's um, uh, recent report outlining the results from your survey on reskilling. And I'm wondering, while you were doing that report and summarizing, were there any surprising insights for you? And what are some of the key takeaways from that research that you can share? Yeah, there were quite a few, and I'll highlight a couple of them here. Um, one of the things we found is that uh, upskilling and reskilling is getting harder. Uh, part of the reason for that is one of the disruptors that's causing this is technology. But what technology is disrupting is concrete work, simple work, routine work, work that frankly is easier to skill people up on. That's the work that's getting automated. The work that's left for people to do is more nuanced, it's more complex, it's more ambiguous, it's more creative, it's more judgment-based. And so what you're finding is that's harder to upskill people on, and there's multiple degrees of mastery on those types of more complex and more nuanced skills. And it's harder to figure out how good people can get at those things. In fact, it's harder to upskill people into a level of mastery in a traditional sort of training environment. Uh, you have to actually learn by doing, and so, a lot of this dynamic reskilling has to happen not only in the classroom, even if it's intense sort of experiential kind of learning, until you really get on the job, it's hard to get to a level of mastery, which requires us to think much more comprehensively and holistically about skilling, about all the micro skills that come together to let someone perform a job really well. It's not just a single skill, it's often the integration of multiple micro skills, which goes back in some ways to that you know, updating the profile. It's not just updating the profile for an individual, it's their peers, their bosses, their colleagues, you know, commenting on how are they doing on these skills? It's constant feedback. It's constantly getting better at the gaps and closing the gaps as the requirements in the job change, which leads to one of the surprising insights. One of the things we thought we would find is companies that were bigger global companies that could really invest in reskilling would do a better job. And what we found is in many cases, the companies that were doing the best at reskilling were smaller companies. And we're not sure exactly right why that's true, but the hypothesis we have, and we have some evidence to support this, smaller companies are reskilling people where they are known. Um, if you think about how many people you can know, you can know pretty well a social network of a couple hundred people. And so in many cases, these smaller efforts of reskilling 100 or 200 people in a smaller environment where they're known, and you can say, wow, I know Ray pretty well. I just don't think he's got all the requisite skills to learn that thing. We might want to point him in a different direction. But Yvette, boy, she's got it. She's got all, I, I know her, and I think she's up to the challenge. And, if, and in bigger organizations, it becomes a little bit more of an administrative Excel exercise or maybe AI exercise, but the AI doesn't have all the data points. There's just, it's, it's too, right now it's too complicated. And the input source data you would need to know, we do, we're not, by and large, we're not collecting that data. So everything that you've said is, uh, sounds exactly spot on from my perspective. And it sounds like skills transformation is really a, a phase, um, a phased approach. So maybe, I know you've done some research in that, maybe you can talk to us about the different phases of skills transformation. Yes, the, there are multiple phases to this. It's not a one and done kind of activity where you just reskill, train people up and they're done. Um, even hiring, when that is a lever that people use, often what you find is the people you hire still need some level of upskilling or reskilling in certain particular areas, even if it's just learning your business, learning your products, learning your markets and your customers. So there's no single solution which is why we're finding that upskilling and reskilling of your current employee base is often a better answer than trying to hire from outside. 
But to do that, it is a phased approach. You first have to understand what are the skills we have today and what are the skills we need? And what are the, some of the foundational competencies and adjacencies that would lend one person in a role to be an eligible and prospective good candidate for upskilling or reskilling for new work? And another person in the exact same role who's well-performing who might not have some of the foundational competencies or adjacent skills that would suggest they would be equally successful in some new work. So first of all, you have to understand the nature of the work that's being done today and that's going to be done tomorrow and the skills that are gonna be required to make that work and that worker successful in that role. Um, that's the first phase. The second phase is architecting the shift and the upskilling of those skills, which isn't just the training, it's also the deployment of the talent into a series of developmental roles where they can get practice and feedback and on the job experience doing it and graduate to levels of mastery. And then over time, you can start to then really shift the workforce into the roles and the work of the future. So um, Aaron and, and Ray, you've both talked about different phases and different approaches. Let me come back to you, Ray, and ask, what does successful skills transformation look like to you? Yeah, I think successful skills transformation is when you have a good market for skills and a good market for opportunities. And that's really where we've got a good match where or employees know these are the top five, top 10 skills to train for. Uh, if you want to advance, uh, these are the ones that we see a lot of demand for. Here's what's being offered internally. We've got a great ecosystem of courses, of participants in play. And I think that's that's when we actually see you know the benefits of where dynamic skills are in place. And then more importantly, having that continuous learning culture inside organizations is important uh, where we see those reward mechanisms uh, for learning, right? For that recognition of why learning is so important uh, to each individual success. So, so I think that's, that's, that's where we'd start, right? Building that continuous learning culture that's in place uh, where companies and employees and the ecosystems, you know, feel that it's important. They make time for themselves uh, for training. It becomes important. They stay curious. And more importantly, you know, leaders lead by example, uh, by taking time off too for themselves to actually develop, whether it's a communication skills or, you know, learning how to recode. Uh, I think they're all very important. Stay curious. I love that. I've always loved that. And it feels more important now than ever. Um, Aaron, how about you? Any, um, any perspectives on your side as far as what successful skill, skills transformation looks like? Yeah, I think uh, I would agree with what Ray said. Uh, I would add there's a team component to this as well. Increasingly, we're seeing real value creation in companies, innovation, execution, new product launches coming from cross-functional teams. And not only do you have to have the right skills in individual roles and jobs, you need to have the right skill mix on a team. And sometimes skills come from different players on the team. And so creating not only the skills marketplace, but a talent marketplace that says, look, we seem to have all the requisite skills, but we don't have anybody who understands the market in China, or we don't have anybody that understands the technical details of this product, or we've got a lot of people who understand coding, but nobody really knows how to code in Python, which is one of the languages we're going to need to build that new feature. So if you understand the micro skills needed, not only for individual roles, but also on a team and create that dynamic teaming of skills, that's where the future is really headed. So if I listen to both of you, there's so many opportunities for advancement and improvement in this space. And um, I, with so many different areas of possible investment, I'm wondering what trends in the skill space do you think we're going to be seeing in this coming year, in the next 12 months? And, and Aaron, I'll start with you. Well, one of the things I think you're going to start to see is people starting to build out their ontology of skills beyond just the skills that people have in the job they're in today. One of the things we've done with people, and we, we have several partners we use to do this, is we'll do an outside-in analysis of, of people's talent and skills. And it often, the outside-in thing that we can do in a week or two is much more robust than a company has of their own skills because all of their own skill data is focused on the person in the job they're in today and they've missed all of the skills that the person has acquired from other experiences that aren't formally tracked in the system of record. So I think the system of record itself is gonna to have to change. It's gonna to have to get broader and we're gonna to have to get better at how do we integrate over time a skill mix and development paths. I also think you're gonna to start to see us incentivizing and rewarding skill acquisition, not just promotion up through a hierarchy. Hmm. 
I think your observation about, and, and you had said this earlier, about our um, you know, skills information in our enterprise is largely based on the skills of the individual for the job that they hold, which means there's such a tremendous gap. I, I think that's a really important insight um, for organizations to take away. There's so many skills, libraries and, and things that are in use, but to your point, um, we just have such a limited, limited perspective. Um, Ray, uh, I'll turn it over to you. What, what trends are you seeing in this space for the next 12, um, next 12 months or so? Well, in addition to what Aaron was saying, I actually say the inverse might be possible. We're going to see AI and ML engines create new job roles and descriptions that we would never thought of before, where we're mixing matching skills to create new positions based on need and demand. So a business unit might say, hey, I'm looking for you know someone that understands how to do data science and multimedia communications, and boom suddenly we create a new role uh, that didn't exist. And we start looking in the organization to say, hey, who's got those skill sets? Oh, we've got an 80% match. Let's go actually hire for this new role that we've just created out of thin air. Uh, and of course, we've got comp plan and comp information and benefit information so we can actually properly pay folks and compensate them for that and build the right incentives. So I, I think this is this is probably the year where we're going to see some of that stuff start to take off and uh, in some very, very progressive organizations. If you think about what Ray just said, there's the work. There are, there's the roles that get created. Perhaps AI will come up with some really interesting roles. There's the workers to fill those roles with the right skills. Increasingly now there's the workplace. We are now in a world where we can be more virtual than ever, but where we still value at times in-person collaboration or at least being in the same time zone. So increasingly place and where having people at certain places at certain times is gonna come into play of how you do some of this dynamic skilling and dynamic team. I love it. So um, we, we talked about the trends. So what are the, what's the key technologies that you see coming? In fact, let me just ask you, what technology are you most excited about? Um, Aaron, I'll, I'll start with you. Well, I'm gonna give a, a non-tech answer. I think with all of the automation and all of the AI and all of the digitization, what we're also going to see is the work that remains for humans to do will be increasingly human. And a lot of those human skills, we do not measure or track very well. We sometimes say things like they are a good leader, which is very broad. Does that mean they have empathy and compassion? Does that mean they're visionary and inspiring? What does that actually mean? And we're gonna have to get better and better at understanding the soft skills. That's a great, um, great answer. Uh, you had me speechless there for a moment. Um, Ray, how about you? I was thinking about the leadership yeah. question here, and, and we actually have a framework for dynamic leadership that you can look up uh, that, that talks about how to get to the core traits and then the varying traits that actually occur. Uh, on a tech front, um, I will answer analytics, automation, and AI are very interesting to me. Uh, that combination of how questions are being asked, how we actually build uh, dynamic feedback loops with automation, how we actually automate, uh, you know, employee experiences and journeys that are crossed the way. And then more importantly, how we actually build what we call a business graph, the ability to actually keep learning and building that tribal knowledge uh, in a digital core. And, and I think that's important where we can actually see those uh, opportunities kind of emerge. Uh, and then of course, AI and VR, like AR and VR are very interesting to me. The augmented reality, virtual reality pieces, uh, I think they're transforming the way we learn and we experience things. Uh, we were doing a, uh, we were in the middle of a training for a first responder scenario Scenario that was all done in AR. And I think you didn't understand the level of chaos until you were in there and you could understand, oh my God, yes. How do you make a quick decision unless you've been trained for this? Uh, because just the level of intensity, uh, the level of uh, confusion all happening at once, I, I think it was a great way to actually bring uh, scenarios to life. So I have to ask you, gentlemen, um, you know, we're all um, future lookers or thinking about what's happening and coming in the future, what's possible. And I can't help but feel that AI has a lot of expectations on it. It has for years with the promise of AI and what was possible even seven, eight years ago, um, you know, under delivered. So are we really at the time when, you know, these, these advances that we're talking about here related to skills and insights, are we, are we finally there where the technology meets the need and we're going to actually deliver? 
Well, I, I look at the same way we look at autonomous vehicles. There's five levels to get there. The basic level is kind of like, you know, here's basic automation. We're on cruise control. You still have to do some steering, right? So that part is definitely in place. Um, I think the second level is a little bit different. That's where we kind of have a little bit of, you know, human intervention, right? We're still, we've still got like autopilot going, but, you know, we'll jump in once in a while if it decides to take a wrong turn. So, so we get that part. So we're, we're definitely at level two, but level three, where we get to machine intervention and that kind of works like you're backing up and it goes beep, 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 erk, right? Oh, why did it break? Oh, there's something behind me, right? The machine intervention part, that's where we're starting to get a little bit good at like, oh yeah, we need to screen out that resume. Oh wait, we actually should include this individual in the search, right? That stuff is starting to pop up where we have those types of suggestions. But then when we get to like, you know, some level of full autonomous, you know, full autonomy, I don't think we're there yet on full autonomy. And I hope we get to that point where we have full autonomous and capabilities. And then after that, right, there's that, you know, humans are optional, right? Now, full autonomous is kind of like you're at the airport and trains are moving around by themselves. There's no conductors. I took this one class, uh, you know, in, in senior year because I needed something on a Wednesday night or so I didn't have to have a Thursday and Friday class. And it was something about the history of like railroad accidents, right? And think about it. It's like conductors drunk, conductors on a cell phone, conductor fell asleep, right? Well, you never see airport accidents and trains because they're fully automated and might be like a Homer Simpson-like character in the back and making sure everything's monitored, right? That's level four. And then level five, of course, is, you know, full, full, you know, humans are optional. We don't need them. So we're getting to that point. You know, the other thing that companies are going to start to explore is their ecosystem. So doing some of this beyond to just their full-time permanent employed workforce and look at a, a gig economy, look at partners and vendors, not just as some monolith who just feeds us uh, kind of widgets to be put into play where needed, but actually to start to treat the talent, even if they're not full-time permanent employed of our own workforce, but treat the talent we're partnering with that we're leveraging that might not be our employees and start to understand their skills, their motivations, their capabilities. I think that ecosystem play is really gonna ramp up over the next year. Hey, Aaron, to add to that point, I think that's amazing. I would also add alumni ecosystems. I think we tend to forget those and, and forget to put those into play. I mean, those are great places for talent, great places for referrals uh, as people understand the culture and, and actually improve the, the net uh, cast in terms of finding the right talent. Absolutely. Well, Ray and Aaron, you've given us a lot to think about. I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Um, to close, I'm wondering if you would share just one piece of advice for our audience as they work on their own skills strategy. Ray, would you like to start? Sure. I think the important part is to have a continuous learning culture and, and really make learning fun again. And I think that's that's important for people to have that, you know, that environment where people just enjoy learning, they celebrate it, they understand it's a lifelong approach. Uh, and, and I think that that's the base of it, getting the right culture inside your organization. Fantastic. Aaron. Uh, I would add to that because I agree with what Ray said. I would add, um, make upskilling and reskilling and skill development uh, a muscle that you're constantly building, not events not punctuated events around specific things. You will have to do that. There will be punctuated events around specific things. But if you wait to start doing the upskilling and reskilling and building out the skills database, and on, if you wait until those events to do it, it's just not gonna work. You need to constantly be working on how do we get better at skilling, upskilling, mastery, um, incentivizing learning, uh, helping develop an apprentice, soft skills as well as hard skills, and even nurturing and developing some meta skills around openness to new experience and learning agility and adaptability. Th these are things that can be learned. So helping people learn how to learn is itself a skill that we can invest in. Well, those are fantastic observations and recommendations. So thanks again, guys, for your time. Much appreciated. As an HR practitioner, you know that skills impact every talent process in your organization. Understanding what skills you have, what's being developed, and where the gaps are is critical to your talent planning. To talk more about creating an effective skills strategy, I'm pleased to be joined today by Janelle Allen, SVP and Chief People Officer at Children's Hospital and Medical of Omaha. Welcome, Janelle. We're so happy to have you with us today. So let's get started. How are you considering skills as you look in the future? And how are you planning your, your talent and your skill needs as you support your organization? 
Yeah, here at Children's Hospital and Medical Center, this is a strategic imperative for us. We are closely watching all market trends, also population trends and illness trends. Those are really key indicators to the future of healthcare needs for us. Our mission is around really impacting the life of every child. So through that, that is really directing our services where they're at today, but also future services we're going to need. In addition, we're spending a lot of time with um, legislators, parents, consumers to understand the industry and the market needs as well. So HR, along with the business leaders, we are very, we have a strategic plan and focus around looking at what are the skills needed, what's the time frame, and then bridging that gap. Great. So as you think about your skill strategy and closing some of your skill gaps, how are you thinking about attracting talent from the outside versus growing talent from inside your institution? Yeah, you know, that's such an important question. And certainly all of those factors play into it as we think about internally is definitely our imperative in where we want to spend a lot of our time and energy. We think that's important. Uh, we have to quickly, we're opening a, a facility that's almost doubling our beds and adding new services in that will open here in September of this year. So a lot of those needs are, are unique skill needs to pediatric care and research and education. So we've had to uh, really position ourselves as a national player versus being a local player around that employment space. So from there, and then we've also put a lot of contingency plans and really focused heavily on our succession planning. So those are the three areas that we are spending our time. So if we talk really around internally bridging our skill gap, we've had to do a lot of things to get people to quickly engage. And we've had some immediate skills that we need that are ready to go here by September when we take our new patient in this big facility we have, but also um, really changing the culture, mindset, and approach around learning and growing. Um, if I take us back just a moment, we have done focus groups and as we're trying to build and revamp our employee value proposition. And learning and growing is was one of our key pillars that came out from our employees that come to us and stay with us. Why is that important? And they say, you know, in their roles, every day they are challenged. I mean, you think about they are doing cutting edge medicine. They're doing cutting edge practices. They're having to pivot. They're having to respond to cultural new norms and realities from patients and their family members. So every day in role, they're very challenged and they have a high variation. With that said, you know, how do we continue to foster and fuel that knowing that healthcare is on a high trajectory of change? Like it's a disruptive time, very exciting for those of us that are all about transformation. But as we think around, you know, really a traditional model going to more of a an accelerated contemporary model where we have a lot of market disruptors in place, we are we have to ensure we have the skill and the talent to meet these needs. So you talk about rapidly reskilling your resources. Talk to us about the tactics that you're using to do that rapidly. Mm -hmm. So through the pandemic, it allowed us the opportunity to start to think creative, like basic basic things like we had barriers around policies. We had a lot of bureaucratic uh, procedures internally where it was just like, we need to back off and say, how do we look at this and really create an environment that our staff and physicians can access learning 24 seven, mobile, easily available, that they also can have a place where they're capturing all of this to you know, have their own transcript, but also to work with their leader on their, their skills planning. So that allowed us to, to really become much more agile and nimble in the learning space, having easier access, different modems. It used to be very traditional a year ago. Um, all of that has changed for us. So that was the big thing around move, removing barriers. But we've also put in some incentives because there are, we've, we're paying for certain type of skill sets. We're going to add some unique compensation differentiators. Those type of incentives are important for us. We're also um, engaging with different partners than we have in the past because 
We used to do a lot of it internally, building and delivering. We can't do that any longer. We have to. There's people that do this better than us that we can help to customize some ways within children. So really changing our philosophy, expanding our partners, and creating different learning paths. And the learning paths are, um, a lot of them are, are specifically in high clinical areas that are very intensive of nature, especially around your critical care environment, but also our leadership, because our, our leadership has to change. We know that we are forever changed, and we went through several series as we've reset our mission, vision, and strategic plan. We've also uh, looked at our values. We've done some um, refinements there, and we are in the competencies. We've revamped our executive competencies, and now we're bringing that into our leadership and our individual contributor. So with all of that, there's a lot of change. There's a lot of skill change. There's a lot of different expectations with that. So as we think through um, our leaders and having specific leadership paths in several areas is what we've created in this response to accelerate our leadership effectiveness. That's great. So when COVID hit, right, I don't know that anybody really anticipated right, how quickly it was going to hit skill changes and, and the new needs that you're going to have um, in your hospital. Talk to us about what you're doing now to anticipate different skill needs, obviously leadership and with this new mission and the way that you're approaching it, but talk to us about what you're doing now anticipating what's to come. Yeah, well, this has become a, a topic truly at the, the senior executive level. Prior to COVID um, or the pandemic, it was an important um, element, but it was not at that strategic level where we have engaged our CFO and others like a senior execs to come in and, and highlight this is a priority and we are intentionally investing in these areas. This has also become a key uh, element at the heart of our employee value proposition. And so if you can embed that within it, again, it's a signal to our leadership in the organization that this is where we're gonna invest in and we've done that. And so that is helping to just confirm the need around the strategic priorities for this and the investments. So high level, I think it's really important. You have to back out and ensure you've got that top level leadership who's willing to invest the time and resources into it because um, without that, it's very difficult to accelerate the skill uh, training and bridging that gap. So outside of leadership skills, what other skills are you anticipating you need maybe over the next one to two years? Yeah, Tech, technological skills for sure. I mean, at the end of the day, everybody is a technology organization, right? And healthcare is not immune to that. We're not immune to it. So we um, have had significant growth in, in our telemedicine, our virtual care other, we've been able to expand our services to other parts of the country through virtual ways. Also, when you think about market disruptors coming in as competitors to our work, they're in, the, in that technological delivery way. So our organization, that is a, a significant focus is technology, but also then compelling communication and very, uh, DNI is a big around the cultural realities because Everything we do is around our patients. Our focus is on our patients and their families so that we can ensure the most highest quality, best outcome for that. And there's a lot of social realities that have changed and the expectations have changed in that. So, uh, and the other pieces around, I use the word conflict, but it's really around just engagement. And we see it in our workforce, healthcare sees it. I think most industries, interest, Industries are seeing that with all of their workforce, there is high stress, there's high burnout, high real resiliency. So that is also a strategic imperative for us too, is how do we ensure that we're taking care of our people, that we have good ways of ensuring holistic well-being for people. So in the healthcare industry, um, obviously you talked about it with telemedicine, you need more IT-based resources. But what other skill gaps are you finding it's, it's really hard to recruit for um, and keep those skills in house? Mm -hmm. You know, I would say anything, honestly, it's the clinical side. We, in our space, but also nationally, there's significant healthcare shortages. It tends to be your patient facing. So your nursing, your RTs, 
all of that, your therapist. And we're even unique because we need pediatric care focus. So that even requires a more an experience employees. So it's very rare that we would hire somebody to be a new grad into these clinical environments. They need to come to us either with experience or we've had to create pipelines for them to gain that experience through college or that first year. Um, we have a, a way to bring individuals into the organization, prepare them over a year to then go into our highly critical areas because we are a children's hospital. Uh, our services are highly intensively skill, um, critical oriented. So that is really where most of our energy is spent. And that is when I think about truly it, an area of concern for us is that meeting it. So we have to not only build it, but ensure we're complementing it with um, other resources and contingency plans. And fortunately, through COVID, I'm really proud of our organization. We did not have to do any layoffs or furloughs. We made an intentional decision not to do that because we knew the day would come where our volumes would be back to where they are. And if we could commit to our people um, during their hardest time, they'll come back and give it back to us trifold. And that's what's happening here. So we don't have, our retention has stabilized. We are also closely monitoring it, as you know, um, you're seeing a lot of research out there that it's 21 into 22 is a, a job churn time. So people have not made moves. They're going to make it. We are preparing for that as well. And so then thinking around the skills, the learnings, the way our employees can find individual and career development, we are being much more intentional around that. Um, we, have to, we need to utilize our Oracle system stronger. There's a lot of great um, resources for us that we're building out on the talent profile, using the succession modules, you know, all of those facets are really going to help us accelerate this and scale it across our several locations. That's great. You, you talked about you're there for the children and to take care of them, but at the same time, there's caregivers involved. And these are their, these are their people, right? And so what I've found is I've talked to your peers across the U.S., you start to see this convergence almost between hospitality, right, and a concierge service and healthcare and how you bring those two together to take care, care of both, both parties that you're serving in this process. Um, so to all your HR practitioners out there, um, you have your chance to share with them the one thing or two things that you wish you would have maybe done different at the start of redefining your skill strategy. So what would you share with people? What would you have done differently? This is a really good question um, because I, I look back and I would say, gosh, our, our team and our workforce is much more agile, flexible, innovative, and courageous than I would have ever anticipated. And that really resonated over the last you know, year and a half. We saw that. And so as we were building our our ways of how we're going to bridge the gaps and the type of uh, approaches to that prior to March of 2020, well, that shifted absolutely in a way that I'm just really, I feel that we can build upon a lot of what we learned through that. And we've had to pivot internally as well to get into this more uh, mobile 24 seven different ways of um, learning and developing. Very, it used to be very traditional. Now we're into high video options, inlets, you know, ensuring all of the people can see their pathing because they want to engage in it. And it's, we're not having to push it. Um, there, there is a, a real hunger for it. And looking back, I would say, you know, those are the type of things, if you build it and there's a compelling way and people can see themselves in it, they will engage and flourish. It is exciting, right? Humans can do some pretty like supernatural, like powerful things and you just give them the latitude to do it, give them some direction and you can really unleash some, some greatness. So it's great to hear that. It is. Well, we appreciate it so much. We appreciate you taking the time. We appreciate you as a customer. So thank you. And I know your colleagues listening will really appreciate your advice and to hear what you guys, what you all are doing. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much.
Janelle, thanks so much for your time today. We really appreciate your insights. And now I'm gonna hand it over and we're gonna hear from Jay Lee from Fujifilm. Hey, Jaceline, uh, good morning and welcome. It is such a pleasure welcoming you and talking to you today about the evolution of uh, skills in the marketplace. Uh, thanks for taking time out. Jaceline, as the CHRO of uh, Fujifilms, you've been leading this whole transformation and the entry and uh, you know evolution to the new workplace. Uh, tell us, uh, how are you considering skills as you look at uh, to the future of business? And how do you plan the talent that you will need to uh, support your business uh, going forward? Mm. You know, with the pace of technology disruptions and digitalizations, our business is changing gears to focus on services and solutions by accelerating digital offering, workflow automations, document scans, and artificial intelligence so that we can continue to innovate with values for our customers and our business partners. So in alignment to our business strategies and the mid-range plan, we examine and diagnose the existing capability of our workforce and map it against the skills and competencies required for the business futures. And in addition, we also advocate for you own your own career and encourage people managers to have a continuous career conversations with their employees to unveil their career aspirations. So as we find the fit of the future skills and the employees' capabilities. This is where we want to get the best match and fit of an individual's career aspirations along with the skills required by the companies and further investing in them by getting the right people for upskilling and reskilling. Mm, very interesting. And I love your idea of people owning their career. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Jesslyn, as you look at this uh, and, and you plan the talent and skill strategy, uh, where are you putting more focus on? Partly you mentioned about it, but uh, are you looking at uh, closing the skill gaps internally or looking at externally or reskilling your people? And, and whatever your strategy is, what's the reason behind that choice? How do you go about deciding that? Mm, okay. You know, for resource management, we adopt 3B approach buy, build, and borrow. So buy is essentially the scouting approach. So where in the essence of time, um, it will be a quickest fix or solutions to fill the existing gaps. And also by injecting new ideas and impart or supplements new knowledge and skills into the existing workforce. So that is a buy approach, quick fix. Whereas build is our emphasis, okay? Because we prioritize um, build, our resources because we believe if our people grow, the business will also grow. Mm -hmm. So at Fujifilm's Business Innovations, each department has a representative as a learning champion. And this learning champion will work with the business leader to gain a deep understanding of employees and team by involving individual employee in the process of future state. So they know the visions of the companies, the mid-range branch, and what are the skill sets that's anticipated for this uh, business need. And then we give the employee an opportunity to shape their own career path. Mm -hmm. So this is in line with our people development strategy, the 4E. If you read my one of my articles out there, my 4E yes, strategy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, my 4E strategy is about engage, enable, empower, and energize. So as we engage and involve our people, we also enable them with necessary tools and resources. And therefore, they feel more empowered with a sense of ownership, autonomy, to realize their full potentials and to mm. perform their absolutely best. So therefore, with the three E in front, certainly they'll feel more energized. So that's my third E. I, and this is very interesting, Jaisalin, and I want to deep dwell a bit on one of the E's, which is about uh, uh, engaging and encouraging people. How do you encourage and engage them to reskill themselves or constantly learn those new skill sets quickly? Uh, you know, you know what? In Fujifilm's business innovations, our PCC, PCC is people, culture, and CSR. Our mission is to maximize and unleash our people's potentials by engaging their three H. Sorry, a lot of acronyms. <laughs> the three P's, the three E's, and now four, four E's, and now the three H. Yes, I love this. This is so simple and I love this. <laughs> so, so the three H is heart, 
the head and the hand. So, because we believe that, like it says, when the business grow, that's when the people grows, right? So, the best way to encourage people to learn their new skills is to make it evident that the business is interested in their personal growth and development. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, the knowledge, as we all know that, the knowledge and skill acquired by their individual is their own IP. This increase their personal value, which no one can take away. And another way to motivate employee is to develop and grow professional leads and by providing them with an incentive that they will receive after they successfully um, acquire the new skills and the really new skills nice. <laughs> and the desired goal that they meet. So, you know, having specific goals and, and rewards can give employee a tangible reasons to make the time that they learn the new technique more uh, beneficial. Mm. So there's a saying, you know, we, we always tell the employee, do you want to be ready or management to work for you to be ready? You know, mm. taking charge of your personal growth, make yourself readily available for the next career yeah. opportunity. So sometimes incentive may not necessarily to be monetary and it could be recognition programs that put them on the limelight to of glories and success. And another approach of encouraging them will be cross-training. Mm. Cross-training can be another way for workforce to learn new skills. And the idea behind the cross-training is also an informal ways of um, on-the-job learning from our peers. So this will also accelerate um, learning. And the most cru crucial part is if the business is descent into chaos or you know sometimes mm. uh, any outbreak, you know some things that happen to one person with the cross training, it will help to back up and supplement the required people at the time. Mm. So just in talking about readiness, and I love the model that you have put in place. Uh, uh, from a business perspective, you know that the the skill demand is changing rapidly. As an organization. Do you have a strategy for anticipating these skills and therefore, uh, uh, you know, arriving at what skills would be required? Mm. You know, I, I read one of the articles uh, from Barclay Life Skills. It showed that 60% of employers believe that adaptability has become more important in this decade than in the past. So it is right to say that, you know, in this pandemic, it is essential to be agile and response to change and adapt to suits almost every environment. So whether in or out of the workforce, or people have faced, you know, people are facing cancelled plan, disrupted uh, routine, uncertainty, sudden closures, or stress and um, upheavals. So while people, while many people have understandably struggles with the unprecedented event of the year, so the ability to transit has been admirable. So instead of anticipating the skill um, shift, we should focus on cultivating adaptability to respond to the rapidly changing landscape. Yeah. So with that in mind, it is essential to keep an ears on the ground and to watch carefully what competitors and the industries or the overall market is doing. Yeah. So when you look at the landscape, uh, when the landscape unfold, then to become more aware of um, the demands ahead, you can become even better and prepare yourself to make a rapid change that are needed. Right. So, so like, like, um, like in order to do so, so it's, 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 it is vital you know, to look at talents that have a great potential in solving problems and be innovative and able to grasp and size opportunities while reacting positively positively to the changing landscape. I just uh, wish we had more times, uh, but as we close this very interesting conversation, I'm very curious, is there anything that you wished you knew beforehand as you as you go about navigating the new age of uh, the skills? You know what, actually, I wish I do have a crystal ball, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I wish I could have anticipated how COVID would have forced people around the world to work from home. Yeah. You know, lockdown has switched from an offline model to 100% remote working. So mm -hmm. all these containment phases of the crisis set gradually resides. And you might expect like remote working to fade away as well, right? 
But however, most companies are working towards a hybrid works arrangement, which also require new skill. Like for example, on, on sales rep, in the past, they just go to a customer side and then present. So there is a hybrid where they have to manage their customer who are on the call and on the, <coughs> the office itself. So now we have to shift the expectation of the sales meeting configurations from just video or, or one way to become yeah. two ways. Yeah, it's, it's really hybrid. So the dynamic is more than just remote works and also extract the role of digitalizations, automations, and artificial intelligence. Mm. So if we, we if we were to new beforehand, we would have rescue and upskills our workforce <laughs> to deliver new business models, right? You know, Jesslyn, I'll tell you, I'll tell you while we are nowhere near getting a crystal ball, but I think machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data, and new technologies are playing a very important role in being able to predict both the external environment and therefore the skills required, but more importantly, look at your internal skill inventory. Hey, this has been a great conversation. I'm sure everybody who's listening to this conversation is getting enriched uh, with the wisdom that you've shared. Uh, really, thank you so much uh, for your time today and look forward to many more such conversations, Jesslyn. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Skills are at the core of every talent process in an organization. They're the fuel that power your company's growth. Haley, tell us how you update your skills inventory at Ithaca College. So in the past, it's been a fairly manual based process. I would say primarily uh, upon hire uh, through the resumes and CVs we collect from our new hires, which gives us a summary of their skill sets. And then probably once per year through the performance review process, uh, we obtain additional information of employee skills and accomplishments that they uh, have gained over the past year. The challenge with that is it's um, not searchable and it's not in a format that we can analyze. So while it can be useful on an individual basis, it's less useful as an institution. What is your biggest challenge with your current skills management process? I think our biggest challenge is being able to assess how our employees' skills develop over time. We have a very good idea when we hire someone what their skill set is, but we have not had a good way to keep track of how they have evolved and gained new skills um, over the course of their employment at the college. And I think that's uh, something that we're missing in being able to really evaluate uh, the current skill level of our workforce. Do you use your skills data to inform your hiring processes? Yes, absolutely. Uh, currently in higher ed institutions, uh, many of us are facing a reduction in workforce due to declining enrollment and tight budgets. And so it's all the more important that we utilize the skill sets that we already have internally to fill needs as they become available. And so it's very important for us to have a good sense of what our employee skill sets are so that we can match them up with opportunities that become available without having to um, search externally. Do you feel confident analyzing your skills data to drive strategic business decisions? I would say at the present time, no, um, because of what I mentioned of not having a searchable database or a way to analyze the data that we have collected for employees. But I am confident that as we utilize the technology that we've acquired and as employees and supervisors become more comfortable with you know, capturing their skills as they evolve over time in the system, um, that we will uh, have a very strong tool to be able to use to, to analyze our current skill set. Haley, we've heard you and we're here to help. Your challenges with skills management are very common. Many organizations struggle with capturing and analyzing their skills data. We can help you understand and leverage the skills of your workforce with Oracle Dynamic Skills. Let me introduce you to Skills Nexus, Skills Advisor, and Skills Center. We'll start with Skills Nexus. Build and maintain an always up-to-date skills inventory. Leverage skills and jobs data that is uniquely tailored to your needs. Understand your organization's unique skills landscape and expose any skills gaps. Next is Skills Advisor. Connect people with personalized learning recommendations. Use the power of AI to help candidates and employees find the right opportunities. 
Unlock the power of your skills and confidently deliver strategic business recommendations. And finally, Skill Center. Nurture career development with a central location to manage skills. Move quickly from recommendation to action. Unleash talent potential and empower employees to take agency over their own careers. With Oracle Dynamic Skills, support current and future talent needs, ensuring that your skills strategy is aligned to overall business needs. Put the power of skills to work in your organization. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you glean insights around how your organization can build an effective skills strategy.